So where we were last time is we were looking at this new unit 5, Tools to Solve the Equations of Quantum Mechanics. And we had finished up developing a general solution to the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. It all hinges on this quantum principle of superposition where we can write a general solution in terms of a sum of some weights times some states times what we call dates or the time dependence that's associated with those states where these states we can determine using the quantum purity test for energy. The main job then, the procedure that we follow in order to carry out the solution is first we need to know what these states are. To get those we look at the quantum purity test for energy and that constitutes what's called the time independent Schrodinger equation so the first task is to solve that equation then we saw how once we have those solutions we can construct the above superposition and then we choose these weights in order to match our initial condition in the uh, example of a free particle that initial condition was an incoming wave packet and then finally once we have the full solution written down we then begin to use our quantum kinematic framework to analyze the results so our focus today then really is to learn how to solve the time independent Schrodinger equation and what you will see as we go through this solution of a particular example but I will I will try to go through it in a general way pulling out the general lessons and tools that you would use to solve this equation under uh, arbitrary circumstances the key theme that's going to come out is that you have to pay a lot of close attention to boundary conditions there's a list of known boundary conditions that are required in order to complete our solution and we will go through those and we will be putting boxes around those to emphasize them that they apply quite in general. Now, getting more towards the example that we were in the midst of working through, I've copied down for here our time independent Schrodinger equation. So this is the equation that we would solve in general. In particular, we're working right now through this example of what happens when a particle hits a potential step. What we meant specifically by this is that there was some potential V of X right which is zero in this region this is the x equals zero portion so in this region when x is less than zero the particle will be coming in so here's the classical view of the incoming particle with a certain energy and I've indicated the energy level with this dashed line and in this region one it's got more energy than the potential energy because it has some positive kinetic energy traveling towards this step in the second region, in region 2, the potential takes a sudden upward step. It won't, strictly speaking, of course, be a true discontinuity. We imagine it, of course, always rounded over at some fundamental length scale, which is smaller than any of the physical length scales in our problem, something like perhaps the Planck scale. So we have this uh, smooth function, but it changes very, very quickly to a constant value, v naught. And, and we're setting this up so that in this region 2 we have what's called a classically forbidden region. This is where the total energy is actually less than the potential energy. That means that classically the particle is not allowed to be in that region. It's forbidden. We then considered what we would expect to happen under either classical physics where we send in our particle or quantum mechanics now where we would send in a wave packet representing a probability distribution for our particle traveling along like our particle in free space until it hits the step. Now, when either of these two scenarios hits the step, let's first focus on the classical case, what happens is because the particle does not have enough kinetic energy to overcome the potential barrier, it once it hits this point x equals zero, it is immediately turned around. It feels a very strong negative force corresponding to the slope of this very large positive slope. There's this large negative force which turns the particle around and sends it back in the other direction. But because energy is conserved, the incoming kinetic kinetic energy and speed must match the outgoing kinetic energy and speed. So classically we would expect a trajectory like this following this solid straight line and we decided just to time things so we will call time t equals zero the point where a classical trajectory actually hits the step. So it would come in with a positive velocity then it comes out with a negative velocity. The quantum mechanical case as we will learn is something quite different. So this is kind of fun. This is the first time we're really making a prediction with our theory of a phenomenon that we haven't seen before. In this case what we will find is that things aren't quite that way. The particle isn't suddenly turned around instantaneously at a point and in fact the center or peak of the packet um, 
can actually follow a path like this where it can temporarily penetrate into the classically forbidden region, but eventually the correspondence principle kicks in and the particle will be completely rejected from the region, which means this probability packet then has to be centered at locations that then travel along like this. The particle will then be coming out. There will be an outgoing wave packet traveling in the opposite direction, and it will actually travel with the same speed uh, that the classical particle would come out with, reflected. And the signature that we will ultimately be looking for that tells us that we spent some time in the forbidden region is that there is going to be some time delay in the passage of the peak of the packet relative to what we would have expected um, from just the classical trajectory. Very good. So now let's begin our analysis. Our focus really is on how we solve this time-independent Schrodinger equation. Now our basic approach to solving any new type of problem is always to first isolate the most complicated piece of your equation on one side of the equation and then to put all the more easily known or understood behaviors on the other side of the equation. So the most complex thing here that I haven't really uh, uh, might be most problematic of course is this derivative. So let's solve for that der the derivative. So the second derivative then of my wave function with respect to x must equal so to isolate this, what I will do is I will put this term on the other side of the equation where it shows up with a minus sign. So I will have e psi minus v psi, and there's two factors of psi I can factor out. So this will become e minus v of x. It's a minus because we've moved it to the other side of the equation, multiplying my wave function. So that's e minus v acting on, on, on my wave function. Now, to solve for the second derivative, I also had to clear this fraction. So I'm going to multiply both sides by minus 2m over h bar squared. Now, just one final step consideration before we begin to consider what happens in the different regions. And that is to notice that we can simplify this already a little bit. We have this complicated looking partial derivative, but notice something very nice here. That we are solving the time independent Schrodinger equation. There is no time appearing anywhere here in this equation. In fact, what we are solving for are pure states of energy. These are pure kinematic states. They have no time dependence. So therefore, this partial derivative only has x as a dependence. So the partial derivative is the same, actually, as the total derivative. So we can simplify this a little bit. And let's denote that by uh, noting down our standard derivative notation for just total derivatives. So I'll use the prime notation. So phi double prime just means two derivatives with respect to x, then takes on this generic form, minus 2m over h bar squared times the energy minus the potential, wherever I might be, times phi of x. Very good. So now we're ready to consider the behavior of this equation in these very two different types of regions, region 1 and region 2.